very good evening to everyone and welcome to uh, today uh, and welcome to everyone and very good evening to everyone so today we would like to present our home basically the kashimbaya palace of the royals uh, the kashimbaya palace of the royals and uh, the primary identity of this uh, uh, meeting is that uh, the promise is that it is our home I don't know. Am I audible or not? Um, yes, and the presentation is clearly visible. Thank you. Okay, so the, I will just uh, repeat. So Murshidabad is a district in West Bengal, and Kashimbaya happens to be an old city which was a port at one point of time. And uh, prior to 1757, it had been the port, and uh, many uh, European countries from uh, from uh, uh, Netherlands. from france from armenia from portugal from britain everybody used to come for over three centuries on their ships and they used to be lot of trade and commerce and export and import from the city of kashimbaya and because of this reason this uh, uh, district of mushidabad was very very rich and uh, for centuries and centuries the european people used to come and they used to buy the products from our uh, uh, mushidabad so i will just briefly read out a few lines that i have written the historical city of kashimbajar is situated roughly around 11 kilometers from mushidabad that is the lalbagh town and before the battle of polasi in 1757 kashimbajar was a riverine port that over many centuries catered to the exports and imports of the three states of india that were bengal bihar and odisha which used to be governed by the nawab of mushidabad who had its masnad in mushidabad masnad means the seat of Power. Ajudha Ram Roy, my ancestor, settled in Kashimbajar because of the opportunities and the scope of business that the city promised. And through successful ventures and hard work of many generations, the members amassed the fortune and carried forward the good name of the family. I will just pause a little bit at this point because prior to 1735, uh, there were two ports in Mushidabad, and the first one being Bhagwan Gola. Ancestors used to reside before that point of time, and that was the granary export center of the district of Mushidabad of, of Bengal. And but then the Maratha Dacoits they came and plundered the city of Bhagwan Gola and burned down the port. And that was the time when they lost my ancestors, lost their business and fortune, and that's why they had to rush down to Kashim Bazar because that was near to the seat of the Nawab's power. and that was the international port and uh, they they uh, sort of over two or three generations they sort of revived their family fortune and mostly the port in those days there were three important things that were used to be exported one was indigo the blue color as you know that is used as a dye in the, for dyeing the clothes and then the other was uh, the silk the cocoons was produced in mushidabad and they were exported to europe and uh, they they were carried and the uh, cloth used to be spun at the mills of ancestors and then there were spices and then there were bell metal utensils which was a secret alloy and the utensils looked as good as gold and was very nice uh, to to eat from and the another important thing was the figuring and carvings of ivory because there were a lot of artisans in mushidabad area who were by generations they were called masters so that was the title by which they were called and they used to produce beautiful figures which even if you look up the the auctions uh, that are run to fishies of sort this they will be able to find uh, those those items that are being still sold as antiques so this is the earliest photograph that we have of the palace and it was the year of 1898 now primarily the identity of this house of the kashimbajar palace is that it is our home it has been our home for the last 10 generations and it has gone through ups and downs of the fortunes of the family and but yet till today it is the primary identity that it is our home and now uh, we have revived and we will go to the story gradually 
this is the next photograph that we have that was taken in the year 1929. So here you see that the guards are standing and uh, they were armed and there were 200 guards who would be guarding this entire palace. I will just take you slightly back to the earlier slide. So you will see that he has a coat of arms. I will briefly expand on this much later. And in the subsequent year, in the year 1929, the coat of arms was not there. It had been removed. Here is a very interesting photograph of the uh, district of Mushidabad. It was uh, done by uh, one Mr. Daniel. So he was very famous and very important person who had done a lot of sketch plans and survey maps for uh, the country of India. And I don't know if you're able to see, here it is written as Kashimbajar, and this is Bhagirathi, the river, and this is known as Kashimbajar River over here. So, it, the, and Kashimbajar has been identified as an island. It says the island of Kashimbajar, because the river was flowing almost all around it, and it was in an almost a sort of island. So it was an international port uh, which was located here, and the ships used to come, and it was a riverine port, and they would uh, take uh, their, their anchor at this point. Now from here, I have I want to show you this uh, uh, this uh, figure that is there on top of one of our entrances. It's a very in interesting uh, work that is done on plaster. It is an European face. Uh, maybe a ship's captain or an army general. And these are the vine leaves, and these are the grapes, grape fruits that are hanging from the plant. Now, exactly, we are unable to explain why this kind of a European facade is there uh, in our building, but it could have been a symbol of the international uh, uh, exchanges that used to happen at that point of time, because the Dutch were very, very prominent over there. And uh, they, they were very rich and they had their own factories. So the Dutch, they had their own factories. The French people, they had their own factories. And of course, the British people, the uh, English people, they had their own factories. So there were three factories producing silk, Mushidabad silk. And this is one of the uh, very interesting examples of an European uh, figure that is there existing in our house. This is another interesting thing. This is the the singular item, the oldest singular item that we have in our family. This is a compass, which used to be used by one of our ancestors, Joan Jogobundu Rai. I will just tell you later on. So this is this uh, compass that used to be, uh, that was used for making the land sketches and maps and surveys. So as I explained, so at that point of time, our ancestors, they were mostly exporting silk, and that is how the family's fortunes grew. And uh, at that time, there was no royalty because the country was independent and was used to be ruled by the Mughal rulers. And uh, then something happened. The Battle of Palasi happened in 1767, and then the British they started ruling our country. And then uh, something remarkable happened. Sometimes around the year 1780, the, the, the government, the new government, they decided to uh, re-channelize the flow of the Kashimbaja River. And they made it flow straight from Bahurampur to Mushidabad. And that is how the Kashimbaja port was closed down. And from a thriving port and an international city, it gradually turned into a village. And uh, the trade and commerce just perished, and everything was finished for good. And our ancestors, namely Jagabundu Rai, he was uh, exporting silk at that point of time, but then he lost his business. And then subsequently, he took up the services under the British East India Company, and he was an, appointed as a Diwan, or the manager of the East India Company's uh, activities in the Maiman Singh Collectorate. And then, as he was a learned man, he was sent to the other side of the river, which we know as Bangladesh, and he was made responsible of creating a lot of land surveys and sketch maps and survey maps. And this is the compass that was used by him. So this is the oldest relic that we have, which belongs to Jagabundu Rai at that point of time. Subsequently, his son, uh, Navakrishna Rai, uh, Nishinga Prashad Rai, he had designed the beautiful front facade of the palace. But uh, we will just come back a little later to that. Here we see his son, Rajkrishna Rai, so attired in a Mughal dress, 
So this was a ceremonial occasion when the photograph was taken. Uh, So here we see that Raj Krishna Roy, he is attired in a ceremonial dress, but uh, which is, uh, uh, it is called an Ajkan. It's a Muslim dress. And in those days, uh, I think the, the pipe or the smoke, which was called the uh, Gorgora. So that was in fashion. And then he, he was also wearing a headgear. And subsequently, in the next picture, we see that the father and the son, the son was Anuda Prashad Roy, and both are wearing headgears and dressed in a Mughal kind of dress. Now, at this point of time, I would just like to elaborate a little bit about our family. So, for the last 10, 10 generations, we are all one sons. And in those days, the health was not very good. And the uh, medical facilities were also not very good. So, Raj Krishna Roy died at a young age. And uh, his son, Anuda Prashad Roy, he was a minor. And then, the estates were very big and there were a lot of subjects who had to be looked after. And then the, the British government stepped into the shoes of the management of managing the estate. And it was the court of wards which had started ruling the estate or governing the estate. And Anuda Prasad Rai was uh, taken up uh, as a ward under the court of wards. So the court of wards used to start, uh, used to manage the estate. And here we see the Anuda Prasad Rai as a slightly older age and uh, here we see that he is no longer attired in the Mughal dress but then the dress is changed into a sort of English dress with low collars and uh, buttons with coats, coats with buttons and here we can see the pocket watch hanging. So we see that- And Mr. Roy, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, there seems to be some background noise of traffic and so on. Does it come from your side? I don't know what this is. Okay, I will try to minimize that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So is it better? Yes. Yes. Now it's very clear. Thank you. Okay. So here we see Ananda Pushar Rai now dressed in an English attire. And uh, so we see that the change in dress and, and as far as society has changed. But then what happened is that Anuda Pushan Rai, he also died at a very young age of 29 years. And uh, the government, in recognition of his benevolent services and deeds, they had given him the title of Rai, Rai Bahadur, which was a very honorable title in those days. The title of Raja was conferred upon three of my ancestors by the British government, not because of any political alliance, but it was given in recognition of various benevolent works carried out by them towards the society. Now, Anuda Prashad Rai, he was given the title of Rai Bahadur, and then he was nominated to receive the title of Raja or, or, or a king. But then he went to Calcutta to receive the title. But then, unfortunately, he passed away on the earlier night, and the title could not be received by him. So then the government decided to honor his wife with the title of Rani. So his wife was known as Rani Anna Rani. And then what happened in, was that in those days, the ladies, they were Pardhan Ashik because it was a Muslim culture that was very, very prevalent. And it was customary for the ladies to stay indoors. And such was the uh, strictest discipline that they could not even come down to the ground floor of their own house. And uh, with the British government controlling the entire estate at the head office, which was situated out of, outside the palace. It was very difficult for the uh, Rani's to communicate with them. And then uh, what happened is that the stark reality was that they were living in a uh, dark age. They started living in a dark age. And to support the income of the family, so she had to sell up all her ornaments. And with that proceeds, she started, she bought some additional zamindari, and that is how she started managing her expenses. So it was a very, very huge contrast that one side there was such an opulence, which was huge estate that was managed by the British manager. And uh, the stark reality is that the Rani's, they lived in the darkness of the house and they had to sell off their ornaments to support their own family. So another Prashant rise uh, with the demise, for the second time, our estate passed under the court of wards. And then his son, Ashutoshna Rai, 
he was a miner and he was started he was doomed under the court of wars and in the year 1898 when he became of age his charitable contributions was recognized by the government and he was honored with the title of raja so here in this picture we see that ashutosh rai he is dressed in a properly uh, princely suit and attire that is quite similar i think to the modern uh, royal attire that uh, the queen and king of england that they they uh, adorn nowadays i think it looks quite similar to that and the dress has completely by this time has turned into an english attire and here he is standing by the silver throne now very interestingly enough this throne belongs to the nawab bahadur of mushidabad and as he was as raja ashutosh chandra was friends with the nawab bahadur so the nawab had sent the throne to ashutosh chandra in palace to show and to as a mark of honor for his friend but then ashutosh chandra is not seated in the throne because it belonged to the nawab who was much higher in the hierarchy so this is very interesting photograph i think the system is unfortunately going into another hang mode okay so this is the next photograph of the family so here we see anoda prashad rai as a young boy and he is attired in the mughal dress the nashutosh nath rai he is attired, attired in a uh, bengali style uh, dress with the uh, dhoti and uh, punjabi and with the shawl and this again is his father anoda prashad rai is attired in the mughal dress now this is a very interesting picture from one of the most important historical books so this the name of the book is masnad of mushidabad masnad is the seat of power and uh, this is written by the historian purnachandra majumdar and uh, in this this picture is taken from this book so here we see see raja ashutosh nath rai he is seated this is the occasion when the title was given to him and it was presented to him by the uh, messengers of the viceroy so the, the the gentleman and his lady both had come down to our house in kashim bazar and then the title was given to him it was a very very honorable occasion because normally the one would have to go to the government house to receive the title but in his case the title was given to him in his own house at kashim bazar so so these are the messengers on behalf of the viceroy and this is maharaja manindra chandra nandi of the other royal family of kashim bazar you know kashim bazar had two royal families and these two gentlemen are from the families of the nawabad of mushidabad so you can see from their dress their uh, muslim dresses with the uh, caps which are uh, different and these two children belong to the families of the nawabad of mushidabad some important people they are seated as per their hierarchy and here we see that other people are seated and here is one gentleman who is having a, a hat so i presume it was quite warm in those days and lot of people they are standing and they are also wearing their head gears and this picture is uh, taken in front of our house unfortunately as the fate would have taken his turn ashutosh nath rai expired at the age of 33 years and for the third time our state passed under the rules of the court of wards so almost for 45 years the court of wards uh, governed and administered our state and here we see my grandfather raja ashutosh nath rai he was only 6 months old when he lost his father and the state went for the third time under the governance of the court of wards so the little brother and sister the sister was older in age so they were both under the governance of the court of wards and by that time the government had matured and their ideas had finalized and then they understood the fate of the ladies who were pardanash in, inside their palace and they understood that they the ladies the mothers perhaps would not be able to upbring the children to and give them such fine education because one day these people would be responsible for the well-being of thousands and thousands of subjects who were under the the, the rule of this um, uh, kings so in such a case so they the government decided 
to put a British governess in our house. So she was appointed as a second mother to my grandfather and to his elder sister. And she was the one who was in charge of upbringing the child and imparting the discipline, the first uh, etiquettes, manners, and whatever is required to be done at the initial stage, stage of an infant and child. The sister was older in age, and she was subsequently married off to the Maharaja of Krishnavar. And but my grandfather, till long 18 years, until his majority, he was under the court of wards. And after six years, the mothers they started complaining, saying that, uh, well, the, the boy is getting an English education, but what about our family, our traditions, our scriptures? So we don't want that this ward to be complete under the guidance of the uh, foreign lady. And then the photo wards removed the governess. And, but then they said that this child cannot remain in the Andarmal with the mothers. So then they sent him to a boarding school in Bharampur, where they rented a house. And uh, during the entire uh, period of his school life, he, was, uh, he would be living in the boarding school. And during the summer holidays, he had the permission to come and live with the mother. Such was the strict discipline in which uh, the children would be brought up in those years under the court of wards. And every day, uh, even as a child, he would have to go to his own office and meet his manager who would be uh, governing his estate. And he would have to sit outside with all the subjects, with all the people who had come to see the manager for their respective problems. And he would just sit amongst them and understand their difficulties and so on and so forth. So by the time he turned 18, he had enough and sufficient uh, uh, knowledge about how to administer his estate independently. So at the age of 18 years, the manager resigned and the estate was returned to my grandfather, Raja And this is the year of 1938, when he was recognized with the title of Raja. And this was given purely once again in recognition of his charities and benevolent services to the society. And this is the uh, royal attire that was customary in those days. And uh, this is the photograph with his wife, Rani Hina Rani Devi. And in those days, it was not customary for the ladies to appear on photographs. But uh, by that time, by the year 1938, I think the times had changed. And uh, one would go and take the uh, photographs, the ceremonial occasions at the most famous studio of Bone Shepherd in Minnesota. And where photographs were taken. So here is another photograph of the brother and sister, which was also taken at the Bone and Shepherd Studio. So this is uh, Sanat. The so Sanat is a citation or a certificate which proclaims that you have been uh, given the title of, or the title of Raja has been conferred upon you as a personal distinction. It means that this title in our family, it was not a hereditary title. It was given in pure recognition of a personal recognition, the biggest honor that a person could receive in the country. And as it was not hereditary, so the next generation may not be proclaimed the Raja. And uh, along with this third title, uh, one would have the royal crest. I will show you the next picture. This is the royal sword, which was presented to him. This belongs to my grandfather, Raja Komalwanjan Rai, and this belongs to Raja Ashutosh Rai. So the royal sword was there, the royal sword dress used to be given, and the son of the citation was given. And one would be given also to have the coat of arms, uh, own coat of arms, which the Raja would be able to use on the top of his house, on his stationery, on, his, on the livery of the guards, and, and so on and so forth. But with the demise of the person, the coat of arms could not be used by the subsequent generation. And that is the reason, if you remember the first photograph that I showed of our house, it carried the coat of arms of my great grandfather, Raja Krishna Rai. And the second picture was taken at the time of my grandfather, who at the, at the time of 1920s did not have his title. So the father's coat of arms had to be removed, and uh, it was no longer uh, existing in the year 1920s. 
So now I will go through some photographs which were taken in those times. So this is my grandfather with his two cousins and his elder daughter. Uh, Kumari Devika Devi, she was my eldest aunt. Taken, of course, in front of our house. And this is a photograph which was taken during the marriage of my grandfather. And this is the time just before he went to marry my grandmother. So there were a lot of ladies and there are some ceremonies going on in the house. And this is uh, the front of the house where this is this gate has been built. It's called the Nahabad Thana. Nahabad Thana is a place where the, where the Shanai place at the entrance. So that is a Nahabad Thana. And this is the front of the building and uh, you see a lot of decorations of the trees and plants and uh, different ways to decorate it. And this is another photograph you see of my grandfather. He has just got married. And very interestingly, my grandmother was only nine years old at that point of time. So this is my grandmother. She's sitting as a child beside me. And uh, this is the room on the first floor. This is a drawing room on the first floor of the Andarma or the inner house where the ladies used to reside. So this is the blessing ceremony after the bride comes home with the, uh, with the bride group comes home back to the bride. So this is a blessing ceremony that is going on. And interestingly enough, in those days, it was customary to have the pictures of the European uh, important dignitaries inside your home. So here we see the two photographs, but they, I think they're quite obscure, so we really don't know whose photographs they were. This is another interesting photograph. This is when my father was born, and this was his first uh, ceremony of uh, rice eating. And here we see that this is the outside exterior of our uh, of the auditorium. It's called the Chandi Mondo, where the puja has been performed, and he has been brought. He's sitting in the car, and the driver is dressed in all his properly attired. A lot of boys and girls and uh, guards, everybody is there. And here he's entering through the front gates of our house. So here is my granddad. So this is the first ceremonial location where the photograph was taken. And subsequently, this is my elder auntie and uh, my uh, next auntie. So they were also photographed at Golden Shepherd Studios. And here is a photograph. So here is a photograph of my grandfather and my father, Pushant Kumar Rai, and myself. So I was a young boy at that point of time. And this is another occasion where a lot of people from the neighborhood, they were there. And there was a tree planting ceremony at one of the clubs. And that is how the photograph was taken. After the independence of our country, suddenly the economic and political situation took a complete turn. Overnight, the system of zamindari was abolished and the fortunes of the family vanished. Once a very beautiful palace that used to be guarded 24 hours by 200 men and 34 gardeners, the building slowly started to decay for want of upkeep. And in another 30 years or so, it could not even distinctly reflect the image that once it was. After a long struggle to resist the ablaze, the family, the restoration of the palace started almost 30 years ago. And today, after a lot of effort, it has been lovingly restored. So these are some of the photographs from the year 2002, where we see the front of the house, the beautiful house, how it appeared. Because since 1953, almost for 60 years, the house had remained closed. Because my grandfather, he had no more sources of income at Tashimbaya. And he uh, shifted his family and his estates to Calcutta, and the house was closed down, except for a few rooms where he would go and stay sometimes. But very ironically, the all the family pujas that were used to be carried on uh, throughout the year for the last almost 300 years, the pujas were performed, the daily puja at the uh, Radha Govinda Mandir is continued. But then, as children, as a young boy, uh, my parents and me. We used to go and stay in the palace for about five days during the Buddha Puja and come back 
very quickly and then pursued my father and his business and I used to go to school and there was no actual reason to carry on living in this house and the house was closed for 60 years and slowly slowly many places the roof had fallen the doors and windows were vanished and then you can see from the pictures how it appeared as, as uh, late as the year 2002. So at this point of time, I would like to take you through some pictures of reconstructions of the house. So slowly and steadily, a lot of things were necessary to be changed in the home. First of all, there were no toilets, there was not, no electricity, there were no uh, the, the beds and the chairs, they had all got damaged. So primarily, it was very important to restore certain things which were absolutely essential for people to live in the home. There was no running water. So these were the things that were started to be, I mean, uh, brought back into the house. And those were the primary concerns of those times. And here we see the Chandi Mundap, where the, uh, the main temple where uh, the Saraswati Puja, Duga Puja, and some ceremonial pujas are performed at different times of the year. So this is how it appeared at that point of time. There were no doors and windows because they were all stolen by that time. There was no floor. And you see the, the, the idol was being built. And here we see that the floor has been, we were rebuilding the floor. And uh, interestingly enough, this place, this Shani Mandap was built sometime around the year 1745. And it was customary to apply paint every year before the Durga Puja. <clears throat> and the paint job was mostly, it was a lime wash that was put on the frescoes. And with almost 275 years, 275 times of putting the lime on the walls, they, all the frescoes, they got covered with lime. And it took almost two years to clear off this lime wash. <clears throat> and this is what we can see that the mason is doing very delicately. He's cleaning off everything. And uh, here you see that it is partly clean. And this is the original color that we see underneath. So that is the only color that was visible at that time. So this is uh, partly when the plaster was cleaned and this is still uncleaned at that point of time. And here after when everything has been cleaned, we have started to put some paint and color schemes. And here the floor has been built in place of the uh, muddy patch which was there. And this is another photograph where we see of the olden times before the restorations. So these are the arches. So this is how it has been. And similarly, the same arches that you see. So it was a long restoration process of almost six years. And just six years to restore this temple. So this is the front of the building. So side by side, some you can see that some work is going on. And this oval is basically a ring. It's like a gymnasium that we have in our modern homes. It was a ring where one would do the wrestling and uh, to keep fit, to do the exercises. And uh, this is the landscaping of the interior gardens that we were doing at some point of time. And here we see that the back of one, one portion of the building. So we had just removed the jungle because it was covered with thick forest, which, which had grown up around 60 years. So the forest had been cut off so that the building is exposed, no doors and windows, no roof. So after restoration, this is the same place that we are able to see here. So from 2002 to 2022, 22 years. Here we see uh, some hand paintings which were appearing. So there are very beautiful paintings on the wall. You know, in those days, there was no wallpaper. So if you need nice decor, so one would commission beautiful artists who would do wonderful paintings on the wall. So here, some parts of the palace, they needed restoration. So from here, uh, we had commissioned the artists. So they had done stencils like this. And then the stencils were put on the fresh walls, walls fresh painted. And then the new painting was put up on these new, new painted walls. But the original paintings are still there, visible in some parts of the world. Here we see the artist, how he has uh, used the colors. And uh, with the stencils, he has put the, like the like dots, like uh, the children, how they do the paintings. And then he's going to 
uh, connect these dots and this is exactly what he's trying to finish. So this is how they were replicated in the original color uh, scheme. So this is one part of the wall when the original color is still visible before the painting was done and we had taken sensors, extensive photographs of these drawings and then they were replicated on the new, over the new painted walls. Here we see the pillars, which had some of the sketches of the old painting. So these were exactly replicated on the, on the new paint work. And we see that they have made the drawings. So these are the borders, which are appearing on top. So it was not finished at that point of time. So now we see that this particular veranda is now completed. And interestingly enough, in those days, the, the marble was not available in plenty. So there was in most of the houses in the interior of Bengal, they did not have uh, any lake flooring. It was mostly cement. But uh, in this case, uh, my great grandfather, Raja Ashutoshnath Rai, he had imported these tiles. I think they were ceramic tiles uh, imported or uh, made in Spain. And this was the fashion of those days. So this was late sometime early at, at the end of 1890s or early 1900s. So it's a very beautiful color combination and a massive jigsaw puzzle of different shapes of uh, tiles, squares, triangles, rectangles, so on and so forth. This is another part of the building. So I explained that this is the wrestling ring and we were rebuilding the gate. And now you see that after it has been restored, so this is how it appears today. This is also on the side of the building. And uh, you see, this is the wrestling competition that is going on. And of course, the building was not restored at that point of time, but now the building is up. So these are the same pictures, side by side. And this is how the house appears today. And uh, interestingly enough, again, this coat of arms has reappeared. So because this is my grandfather's coat of arms, so which came in the year 1938, when he was awarded the title of Raja. And whatever we see of the gardens and everything, they have been rebuilt because everything was lost over a period of time. And you know, with the lack of maintenance, everything has vanished. So we had to rebuild almost everything other than the building, of course. So this is another side view of the building, main building from the side. Now, this building particularly has been built in an European style, and this is the road in front. And um, in those days, the, the mode of transportation was horses and by horse-drawn carriages. So this most of the buildings, they had an entry gate, and this is how the carriage would come inside. They would drop the passengers in front of the building, and they would be guided outside through this gate. There's another gate over here, it's not visible, and it would go straight into the stable houses because the cars, the carts, and the horses they were always parked in the stable because they were not very hygienic and they were not very uh, uh, clean. So, and till today, we don't have garages in our house, so our vehicles they need to be parked uh, on the outside actually under the sky. So this is the clock tower. So the tower originally was built up to this place only, this portion only. But then my father always wanted to have a clock tower in the house. So I have designed this tower at some point of time and so this was built about 15 years ago. This is another view of the house from another angle. And here you see that the main road in front of the house is visible. And like in European castle, it was customary in those days. So to uh, have people, uh, let them have a view, to, a view of the beautiful house inside and the gardens could always be in front of the house. This is another view. So let me take you a little bit into the insides. So this is one of the Darwar house, the main uh, conference hall of this palace, so where uh, official meetings could uh, could be would be taking place 
and uh, when my ancestors they would be listening to or taking uh, decisions with their ministers and so on and so forth this would have been the place and now this is called a shava ghat shava is an assembly so it's a bengali word and here on the wall you will find the most delicately carved frescoes they are of course uh, done in a uh, line and sand plaster so it's called a punk punk or work in uh, in the local language and this auditorium has probably the most beautiful punk work in the entire district of mushiralal so this is the interior uh, portion of the andar mahal so that the andar mahal is the inner house where the ladies used to stay so this andar mahal had been uh, dilapidated and the most neglected part of the building so after restoration we see that the andar mahal is visible now so so these are some of the pictures so because the restoration is a continuous process it is uh, no part of the building is completely restored it's well, you do up something and then the building is so big that uh, the other part needs restoration or attention so you move to the other side the earlier part needs attention again so it's a continuous process so these are some parts of the uh, andar mahal the floors have been laid out but they were not polished at that point of time when i taken the photographs and all the furniture they have been uh, relocated here so you know in those days there was something interesting because since our estate had been governed by the court of wards for almost half a century a lot of protocols were laid down in our house for example when the europeans used to come to visit our family it was important to have party for them maybe a ball and a beautiful uh, dining a facility with uh, nicely prepared cuisine uh, prepared by expert chef but in the interior of bengal how could you have a fine dining experience because it was not available so you needed to have your own chef so a uh, goan chef was appointed in the family for generations and then uh, the chicken was not available so a huge uh, area was demarcated where the cold beef was reared where the chicken was used to be reared uh, with ponds and then crockery and cutlery how do you get crockery and cutlery in the heartland of bengal in the medieval ages so you needed to import them from india and uh, and where do you store them you store them in almiras and uh, you needed uh, spaces to store those almiras and uh, uh, as a young person my father had uh, found a lot of almiras stacked with uh english properties beautiful properties of fine china and those were almost lost but uh, because of his careful attention and details he had uh, preserved them and he had locked them up in some almirahs and other parts of the palace and here we are able to present them beautifully in a very very uh, antique cabinet and you see a beautiful property that is laid out here so here we have one set from france and the rest are all from england so here is a close up of the crockery that we have from those eras and a uh, lot of interesting things soup bowls deep dishes and particularly i would like to show you this particular dish now this appears like an ordinary plate but here is a bowl and this is this much deep so the purpose of this is that to put warm water or hot water inside so you always had a hot plate so the food remaining hot so it was a very important innovation of those days another close up of the fine crockery now here is another uh photograph of the, the palace the one part of the palace you see uh this is the portion where the roof was not there so we we had rebuilt the roof and then the the panelings were laid out because they had all vanished over a period of time and now we have a beautiful 60 tower restaurant in the same place which is available for our in house guests and also for dining for the visitors and the local people 
and uh, this is our menu. So this is how the, menu, the front of the menu looks. And, you, and uh, this is very interesting. So we try to recreate some of the uh, traditional cuisines of from last 200 years, which were there in the palace. And we, we recreate that cuisine. It's called a Raj Bhog. Raj is for the kings, and Bhog is the meal. So it's the king's meal in short. So that we try to lay out. It's a ceremonial meal. Uh, suitable for marriages and it's laid out on the yellow metal plates which is the kasha utensils so this was this kind of utensils used to be exported from Mushidabad to europe at one point of time so these plates incidentally they are 200 years old minimum at least because we found these plates stacked up in wooden caskets and uh, stacked up one on top of the other and they were all very dark and unusable. So at one point of time, we thought we'll sell them off and get rid of them. But then we took them to the shops and then the shopkeepers, they polished them for us and they became as good as new. So here we, we try to recreate the traditional Rajput cuisine for our guests in this kind of a, a presentation. This is the main drawing room of our palace. So of course, over the uh, periods of time of misuse and neglect, all this furniture they had uh, uh, deteriorated and the upholstery had to be redone and the tapestry was redone, the roofs painted and uh, they were all relocated and fortunately we still had the furniture, they were not stolen and uh, they are from the time that this drawing room was built sometime around the year 1830 or 40. Uh, these are some of the rooms. Now, I would like to say that the, the uh, nature of the building is primarily it is our home for the family. And then we have also guests staying with us. So there are 14 beautifully restored royal suites uh, that is uh, able to host the guests and visitors. So these are some of the rooms that, of the palace that we have recreated in very, very traditional time, uh, style and with antique furniture. This is another room. There's some more pictures of other rooms. This is one of the verandas on the first floor. So this particular portion has not been restored as of date. So I had shown you the paintings, the hand paintings from one are taken from one of these walls. So it is still in an original condition, of course. Over the period of time, the paint and everything has deteriorated. And uh, at present, we have not touched it. So let's see what we, when we are able to figure out something, we might have restored this part also. This is the main drawing room of the first floor of the other man. So if you remember, I had shown you the photograph of my grandfather uh, when he got married with my grandmother. So this is the place exactly where he was seated. And these are the places where the pictures of the European important persons were um, set up. But I don't know, somehow they have vanished. We don't have them anymore. And they were replaced with different photographs at different points of time. This is one of our, one more of our royal rooms. This is the Shiva temple that is inside the palace. It's also a very, very beautiful structure. It was built by my grandfather sometime around the year 1930. This is the uh, temple of uh, Krishna, Lord Krishna. And uh, this is the place where the puja is performed daily. It has been going on for last uh, almost since 1735 till date. Every day the puja has been held. And uh, in the house, in the palace now we have a confectionery outlet, so that's our company by the name of Sugar and Spice. Now the restoration and renovation of the palace and the conversion of it is supported by our company, the Sugar and Spice. And uh, we have a beautiful confectionery outlet in the palace uh, campus for our guests. And this is also a souvenir shop that is also in the palace grounds. So here we try to showcase local handicrafts, mostly Mushidabad silk. You know, Mushidabad has always been famous for silk for more than three or four centuries. And we are trying to present uh, Mushidabad silk for the visitors and guests. And also 
Now, you know, in those days, uh, the ivory figurines were very, very beautifully done, but now ivory has been banned. So now some of the craftsmen, they have started doing their uh, handicrafts in uh, wood called natural wood, it's called sola, S-O-L-A. So it's a natural uh, stem of a plant which can be carved and carved into beautiful figurines like this. So we try, the palace tries to support the local art artisans also and local arts and crafts also. And this is also a very interesting thing. So this is uh, artifacts made in glass, just like blown glass. So these are the kind of things that is also available locally. These are some of the pictures of the interior gardens of the palace that is beyond the building at the back side. So there are two ponds and uh, beautiful gardens are there. This is of the interiors. And this is of course now we have a, a badminton court for games for our guests to play, for the children to play. There are different views of the palace from different uh, times of the year. Now this fort has been relayed after a period of 70 years. It had been covered under thick growth of, uh, of trees and shrubs. So it has been relayed and it's a playable play court where we, we and along with our guests we play almost every day. So now how to make the commercial viable so the resilience so we thought of bringing in guests so how do we quickly bring in guests so we thought of giving uh, a wonderful experience or two nights three days a package holiday experience for guests so this is the bus that is owned by the palace it's nicely designed and we have traveled almost 15 we made almost 15 trips in one year uh, with our guests and they came and stayed in, with us for two nights and three days. We took them around the palace for a, a guided tour of our palace, a guided tour of the other palaces in Mushidabad, and a lot of uh, dining, fine dining experiences, storytelling, as I'm doing right now, and also with choreographic performances by children and sort of things. So this is how we take our guests for a tour of the palace. So sometimes I become the guide leader also and this is how we take the, our guests to see the other beautiful uh, buildings of Mushidabad. so this is incidentally you may be guessing this is the Hazardwari palace of the Nawab in the Lalbagh area the palace of thousand doors in Mindok and this is a uh, uh, Boronagar palace it's a beautiful terracotta temples which is also in the district of Mushidabad. and this is Koshbar on the other side of the river where Nawab Shirajuddullah along with his grandfather Nawab Ali Wadi Khan is buried. So these are the uh, burial grounds. Now I will just show you some photographs of the uh, different events and uh, rituals that are carried on throughout the year in the palace. And the, the tradition is for last 300 years almost. Starts with Saraswati Puja. And this is the recently concluded the Jol, Jol Jatsa of Rana and Krishna. We celebrated about 10 days ago. So this is how it is done. And the local uh, folk dance of the life of Krishna has been performed here by the children. And uh, uh, men and uh, the local people, they perform with live music and live uh, dancing. And the guests were there, so they have enjoyed the shows. Sometimes we put up cultural evening events in front of the palace on the octagonal patio. Now, incidentally, this Ratio is actually a bandstand, which is uh, where, where the band would be uh, playing when there was some ceremonial officials going on inside the main drawing room of the palace. So now we have regularly cultural events that are performed by children and other artists in front of the palace. Next is the Annapurna Puja, which will be performed on the 9th of this month. This is also a Hindu uh, puja that will be performed. And this is also another some set of photographs from the Dojatra, which was performed. Next would be the Ratha Jatra, the, the chariot of Lord Jagannath, uh, which would be pulled. So this also is a tradition of since 19, uh, 1735, which will continue. So here you see the chariot, which is housed at a different uh, place, garage, outside the palace. So it is pulled on this particular day and it is stationed in, in the palace. And after seven days, it will be returned to the original carriage. So 
so this is how the chariot is pulled by all the local people with a lot of enthusiasm next important the most important celebration of course is the durga puja which is play, uh, which is performed in the uh, chandni mandap you see the mandap has been completely restored now and there are a lot of cultural events that goes on a lot of musical performances by different motive artists and sometimes i also perform with the with the people and this is a photograph of when the goddess is immersed in the ganges now this is something very important is that you see that the river so this is the original uh, river that was going to kashim bagar and this was the area which was actually the port for almost 300 centuries so this is about half kilometer from our house and this is exactly where the goddess is immersed into the water so different cultural events and performances which goes on while the goddess durga is there in the home it's a time for celebration for everyone next important puja is the kali puja which just happens after a few days after the durga puja and subsequently the jagadhatri puja and uh, of course after that the winter festivities so throughout the year she try to re rejuvenate the palace by creating different uh, puja ceremonies events and their guests they are all invited they, they are part of the palace they stay with the family and they enjoy and we all enjoy together so that is the essence that we try to give them an experience of staying in a medieval castle and enjoying the of the, the traditions and art and forms of the bygone era now in this photograph there is something very important interesting that is visible so this is the main lounge of the andar mahal and this is the photograph before it was restored if you look very carefully this is just another ordinary building and where the floor was down it's about four and a half feet below the main main uh, building and this was the open courtyard it had no roof and uh, even prior to this there was a well in the middle of the uh, of the courtyard which would provide the fresh water in those days now when we built the rooms all around this palace and we in fact we have now six rooms on the ground floor and six rooms on the first floor so there was no uh, plumbing or the sanitation sanitary lines so we all those had to pass to the courtyard and then we found it interesting that uh, we have raised this courtyard to the level of the uh, floor and now we have beautiful uh, lobby or a lounging area inside the palace and this is how we have celebrated the winter the christmas this year and lot of performances by the little children and here you see a uh, traditional art a uh, folk art of murshidabad it's called uh, rai uh, alkap alkap is a song rendition and where the uh, uh, song rendition along with live music along with people performing uh, theatrical uh, things and here it is uh, what is performed is the killing of the demon by the goddess durga so that is the play has been enacted and in those days it was customary for the men to dress up as women and perform so here the same thing is uh, performed and we try to support the the palace tries to support the local art and culture in this way by uh, inviting the artists to perform in front of the guests and the dignitaries from time to time this is a close up of the same art you see the durga and the, is playing the she is playing the demon and the tiger is here and arti and sarsoti and uh, ganesha everybody is live performing uh, in, in this beautiful wonderful uh, performance this is another form of traditional murshidabad art, uh, art form is for uh, rai vesha so here you see the people they it's almost like a gymnastics that they are performing and you know this uh, exactly in bengali language is called ranpa ranpa is a as a form of walking you know this this is basically the people are standing on two bamboo sticks and in those days there were two purposes so one could walk very fast from one place to another because there was no transport facility transportation facility 
so one would uh, get on top of the bamboo poles and they were able to uh, travel long distances very fast and the other reason was that the other cause was that in those days the dacoits also mastered this art and they would loot people's home and they were able to run away very fast so this is uh, the two uh, purposes of this drone park and here we see that they are performing a very nice dhc here of course uh, this uh, chandni mandap it is used uh, throughout the year for different uh, kinds of performances for different people a different set of audience here the children of don bosco uh, they had come to visit our palace and so the local children they put up a beautiful show for the for the fathers and for the children and there are there were about 100 of them there seated here so we all enjoyed the show together and uh, sometimes we have a court magician performing a magical art on our visitors so they are able to cut off the necks without killing the person and they are able to put back the neck again together so <laughs> here we see the local magician so we also try to support his uh, uh, art and his uh, skills so this is also another performance so we have lots and lots of performance going on throughout the year in this beautiful chandni mandap so now there is a definitely a purpose for this beautiful temple so not only for pujas for but for everyone to enjoy throughout the year for different uh, performances now recently the palace had thrown the doors open for a local uh, artist and uh, there was a live exhibition of paintings by the master craftsmen and also for a lot of artists who did live paintings and there were a lot of visitors so they came and uh, uh, spent the time for three days painting and then they went back and now we have a lot of uh, ceremonies in the palace also we are able to host a uh, uh, weddings uh, destination weddings also in this way and uh, this is how the decoration goes on in fact this was the first time it was uh, done and planned for my own children my son and daughter in law it was a reception in the year 2020 and, uh, and this is how we in after 70 years the main darbar hall was it came to life once again after 70 years with the reception of my son and daughter in law so this is our such ceremonial photograph in the radha krishna temple with our relations my father mr kushant kumar roy my mother mr supriya roy my son saurav roy wife priya roy her mother my wife sudeshna roy and my relations of course myself here and here is a photograph of my grandfather with his automobile the studi baker car in the year 1928 so why i am showing you this photograph is that by the year 1928 or a little bit earlier the stables they not only houses house the horses and the carriages but by that time they started housing the motor cars as well so it was an era of modern engineering and modern motor cars they also started being kept up in the stables and this is the official used car of my grandfather the 1928 the vicar president stated limousine which was housed in the kashin bazar palace of course uh, it had went into a state of disrepair and my father had brought it to calcutta in the year 1963 before his marriage and he got married after restoring this car and brought my mother home in this car and then i also got uh, the married and my wife and we we traveled in this car to our home and also my staff and doctor in law they came They got married and traveled in the start. So this is how the car looks after restoration today. Now uh, we do uh, proper restoration. We have a restoration unit for anti for restoring anti automobiles in our own facility. So our car has also been restored in house by our own technicians. So this is the interior of the car. It is one of the most beautiful limousines that exists. in the world today it's one of a kind in the world now. so this is uh, one short video i want to show you 
This is during the Durga Puja. So. And uh, this is a uh, one more video clipping that I would like to show you. So this was presented by the children of the local area for uh, the Mush during the Mushidabad Heritage Festival. And here, uh, Mr. Bruce Bucknell, the British Deputy High Commissioner, he had visited our home. So he's seated here with his wife and a short sketch of the video. So a lunch was organized at the palace for all the VIPs and the dignitaries and the participants who had been a part of the Mushidabad Heritage Festival. So this is some more, some more of the pictures of the house uh, as it appears today. And finally, the coat of arms of my grandfather. Basically, uh, as I said earlier, one would be able to use this coat of arms on top of the building with the permission of the government. And of course, you see it is a replica of the British coat of arms with the lion and the unicorn on both sides with the British crown on top and the person's individual name inscribed in the middle. So K and R stands for my grandfather's name, Raja Kamala Rajan Roy. So this is our caption. So we try to bring history alive for our guests. So come stay and experience history alive. So that is what we try to uh, tell our guests. Thank you so much um, for preparing this um, meticulous uh, lecture with all the images and you know giving us really an insight into the family, into the into the history of the family from in the palace from the 18th century, how it changed until now, how the palace changed the people, how the people changed the palace, how global culture and objects influence this palace, but also how the inhabitants again changed this and brought their own ideas in, into this. This is really fascinating to see. Also thinking about, you know, the plates that you said that were also produced and then exported. So it really went both ways. This is fascinating to see. And the other thing that that I found most striking is um, everything that you really do. And this is like a, a palace that never sleeps, it seems to be. So much is going on. It's, um, you know, it's not only about the family, but you see the close ties with the community, all the events going on from performances and from weddings, um, from supporting the local artisans, having a shop. I mean, there's just so much that you do. I think it's really exemplary. And even, you know, how you bring the other palaces into the picture. I think that's really wonderful. We always say collaborate, collaborate, collaborate to owners of historic houses. And this is really, you know, all the attention you put and the love you have for this built heritage of Moshida. But, and, and this is really wonderful 
wonderful. And I really hope that some of the audiences and, and people who are here will have the chance to visit this property and even you know, uh, collecting and finding, sourcing again, all these uh, beautiful um, pieces for the bedrooms and even the car. I mean, it's just, there is just so much to it. And, and things that were lost were also retrieved. So it's really just really amazing. So thank you so much for I would also everything. like to add and thank my uh, daughter-in-law, Priya Roy. Uh, she is here with me. So yeah. she is the one who has prepared the slides for us and the entire presentation. So I only did the talking, but she is the one who's done everything for us. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So please um, come and visit uh, the Qasim Bazaar Palace and visit the other beautiful palaces of Moshida, but like Hasa Duari Palace that you said, and we are also in touch with the ASI. Um, it is under the ASI. Um, and uh, thank you again. And, you know, we'll stay in touch. I'd love to share some of the images on social media as well for other people oh. to see, because this is, you know, really what is so nice about the lecture. These are things you wouldn't really know, right? You see an image somewhere, but, you know, all this richness, all of this that is going on is just, um, it's just, you know, we can't know about this. And, and this is fantastic that you share this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So, and again, Happy New Year to everyone, this time um, from um, City Palace uh, in Udaipur um, to West Bengal. <laughs> See you very soon. See you, too. Happy Bye -bye. New Year to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.